Hello, everyone. My name is Ken Christensen, and I'm the Carolyn Ed Kaplan Dean of the Armour College of Engineering at Illinois Tech. Welcome to the virtual expo of the Armour R&D Summer Immersion Program for Summer 2021. The Armour R&D Summer Immersion Program provides innovative individual and group research experiences for students from around the world who receive college credit for their endeavors. This program also provides advanced high school students with the opportunity to pursue engineering research and development. This summer, students have performed research in person and remotely from around the globe, including a number of students in India, all under the guidance and mentorship of Armour College of Engineering faculty and graduate students. I'm proud to celebrate the accomplishments of these students and I also offer my deepest appreciation to those faculty and graduate students who provided mentorship to them. I hope you enjoy the excellent showcase in this virtual expo of the Armour R&D Summer Immersion Program. And I encourage those of you who haven't taken advantage of this unique opportunity to do so in the future. Hello everyone, I'm Reshu Agarwal. Hi, I'm Namrata Taudari. I'm Meghna Narwade. We are students of Builder Institute of Technology, Mesra, under Summer Research Immersion Program at Illinois Union Institute of Technology, Chicago. So let me just share my screen. Uh, yes, is it visible? Yes. Okay. Effective speaking involves three main areas, the words you choose, how you say them, and how you reinforce them with expressions and body language. So the basic goal of our project is to build a response sentiment analyzer, which would help the users to enhance or assess the facial expressions and the content of their responses during an imp important meeting, interview, or conversation. The main objective of our project is to help people better analyze their facial emotions along with the polarity of their answer or response. So for that, we implemented a system that could recognize eight basic emotional expressions as shown over here of, of the subjects using facial landmark extract, extraction technique and a system to detect the polarity of the text obtained from video or audio and classify the text as positive, negative, or neutral. So here are some of the tools listed and I would request uh, Namrata to discuss upon this. So the hardware component used in our project is NVIDIA Jetson Nano, which has a 128 core GPU emphasized on deep learning. Our system mainly consists of two parts. The facial emotion detection part, which uses TensorFlow to build deep neural network, OpenCV for video processing, and Dlib library to detect and extract landmarks from faces. The second part of our system is text sentiment analysis, which uses the Pi Audio library to record the audio and the speech recognition library to convert audio to text. The text blob library offers a simple API to access its methods and perform basic NLP tasks. We have used this library to analyze sentiment of the extracted text. Our next slide. So this, this is a basic workflow how, of how we have built our facial emotion detection system. The human face is extremely expressive, able to convey countless emotions without saying a word. And unlike some forms of nonverbal communication, facial expressions are universal. The facial emotion detection is built from scratch to detect one of eight emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, surprise, fear, disgust, and content. We created a dataset using images from the CK plus dataset, Jeff dataset, TFEID dataset, and the Radboard face database. 
the created data set is composed of eight classes with a total of 3000 images divided into training and test sets. The DLib library in Python is used to detect faces from images and extract 68 relevant landmarks from the detected face. These landmarks are normalized and saved in a .csv file. The file is then used to train and test our deep neural network. The model used in building the deep neural network is a sequential model with three hidden layers. The type of layers used are dense, which implies that every neuron in the dense layer receives input from all the neurons of the previous layer. The activation function used was a sigmoid. We have used the Adam optimizer to adjust the step size depending on the loss. The accuracy attained after testing the neural network was about 86.75%. Next slide. The DLib library uses a histogram of gradient function to detect the face. The predictor function in the DLib library then places 68 landmarks on the detected face. The DLib library accurately detects the facial landmarks at an angle of minus 30 to plus 30 degrees in any direction. The normalized coordinates of these facial landmarks are then passed to the deep neural network which classifies the emotion from the image. To improve the accuracy while performing real-time processing, we set a threshold for the level of confidence for each of the eight emotions. We only display the emotion if the confidence level of that emotion is greater than its threshold value. If the emotion detected does not cross the threshold value, we display the emotions rendered in the previous frame. Now I will perform real-time testing for our facial emotion detection algorithm. Now ratio will take over. Thank you, Namrita, for the brief explanation. So now we have text sentiment analysis. So text sentiment an analyzer is a tool that is basically used to predict the polarity of a sentence or passage with the help of various techniques present. As you can see the flowchart shown over here, our text sentiment analysis algorithm with the help of text blob library allows us to determine whether the answer or response of the speaker is positive, negative, or neutral by calculating the average polarity over each word in a given text using a dictionary of adjectives and their hand tagged scores. For this purpose, it uses a pattern library which takes the individual word scores from Senti WordNet. The polarity lies between minus one to plus one where minus one indicates negative answer and plus one indicates positive answer. We have used this polarity scale to set a threshold which allows us to classify answers as either positive, negative, or neutral. That is, polarity above 60% is classified as positive, polarity between 40 to 60 percentage is classified as neutral, and polarity below 40% is classified as negative. So now we have Meghna Narvade, We'll be discussing the integration of the workflow part of our project. The integration process is basically combining the two modules explained above, that is, facial emotion and text sentiment detection. The integration part is being done using multi-threading, which helps us to run multiple function calls simultaneously. That is, one thread records the video using OpenCV, and the other thread records the audio using PyAudio and the output of each of these threads will then be served as an input to the two modules implemented, which will then predict emotions and analyze the polarity of the content obtained from the audio. We calculated the FPS rate for the multi-threading process by dividing the total number of frames with the elapsed time of the program, and the FPS recorded was about four to five frames per second. Next slide. Uh, here are a few applications. We can use our system in debate competitions to analyze the performance of debate candidates. We have considered a short snippet of a debate to see how our system 
performs on real time data. Uh, could you please share the video? Uh, yes, just a minute. term, it is generally a referendum on his record. But Vice President Biden, you like to quote one of your dad's sayings, which is don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And in this case, sir, you are the alternative term. It is generally a referendum on his record. But Vice Ah, uh, yes. So in the video, we saw that the facial expressions of each of the faces were, uh, from the frames were detected and the system extracted text from the audio. So a total of five sentences were detected out of which there was one positive sentence which has a positive average positivity of 68%. So zero negative sentences were detected and four neutral sentences were detected uh, which has 53% of average neutrality. Uh, we also have a pie chart shown uh, in the slide. Uh, next slide. So another use case can be to assess behavior during an interview. Consider the following snippet. We have another video. Uh, yes, just a minute. Hi there. My name's Ben, and I've been working and living in the UK for the last six years. I specialise in sales in the FMCG sector and have done for eight years overall. In my first two years here, I was an account manager with Unilever specialising in the hospitality sector before I made the transition over to Coca-Cola Great Britain, where for the last four years I've been a sales manager over in grocery. I've really enjoyed my time and my experience in the UK, but now it's time for me to get back and stuck into the Kiwi market. Uh, so, uh, in the video, we saw that the facial expressions were extracted, uh, were detected, and the system extracted the text from the audio and found that there were six sentences that were detected, out of which there were five positive sentences, which has an average positivity of 79%. Uh, no negative sentences were detected, and one neutral sentence was detected, which has 48% of average neutrality. Next slide. So the presented project is research on FER and analyzing text for the sentiment, which allowed us to know a way of sensing emotions that can be considered as mostly used AI and pattern analysis applications. The presented model can detect facial expressions of a person and analyze the sentiment of the text that is extracted from his audio. Mm -hmm. this model can further be trained to improve its accuracy and also the extracted audio from the video can be used to perform speech emotion detection to recognize and improve the emotional aspects of speech. Next, next slide. So here are some references uh, that we have used. Next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Ritika Nigam. Hi, everyone. This is Arpan Kundu. And today we, that is me and Ritika, are going to present our project, which is Mavis AI, Artificial Intelligence-Based COVID-19 Norms Surveillance System. In March 2020, World Health Organization had declared pandemic due to COVID-19. Since then, coronavirus outbreak has caused a global disaster with its deadly spreading. Though vaccines have been developed by various nations, but as stated by the WHO, vaccines rarely protect 100% of the recipients. Therefore, in order to completely curb this pandemic, it becomes very important for all of us to continue to follow all the necessary precautions. 
that is to maintain social distance, to wear a face mask and to have a proper crowd management in public areas. Manual monitoring of these norms tends to be quite inefficient and inaccurate. Thus, this brings out the main aim of our project, which is to design an automated machine vision surveillance system for real-time monitoring of COVID-19 norms, which would offer the advantage of cost effectiveness, accuracy, feasibility, and security, and would, over, and would overcome the real-time challenges faced during manual monitoring of norms. Let's look into the objective of our project. The objective of our project is to build Mavis AI. Now, you must be wondering, what is Mavis AI? So, um, Mavis AI is a machine vision surveillance system based on artificial intelligence, which would be used for the alleviation of COVID-19 search. Our system, Mavis AI, will be used for monitoring three different tasks. First, it would be used for monitoring social distancing norms by detecting and tracking humans, and will be also used for counting the total number of humans for crowd management. Second, it would be used for detecting the face mask and keeping the track of face mask usage by the detected people. And lastly, it would be used for raising real-time alerts using a telegram bot whenever any of the following norms are breached. Overview. So our system Mavis AI consists of three different modules, which are face mask detection for keeping track of face mask usage, human detection for social distancing, and alerts for sending out real-time alerts whenever any of the norms is breached. Moving on to tools. The software tools which we have used to build our system are the Python programming language to code our system, the OpenCV image and video processing library, the YOLO neural network architecture to build the main detection model of our system. The hardware tools which we have used are the NVIDIA Jetson Nano for computation purposes, an IMX 21977 camera for capturing the video scene, and an external monitor for visualizing system output. Let's dive deeper into the different system modules present in Mavis AI. The first module is the face mask detection module. This module uses mask YOLO view tiny model to detect the face mask and classifies it into three different classes using the colors of bounding box. The first class is denoted by a green bounding box annotated with a good remark. It represents that the person is properly marked. Second class is denoted by an orange bounding box annotated by a bad remark. It represents that the person is not wearing a mask properly. And last is denoted by a red bounding box that represents that the person is not wearing a mask. Moving on to the second module of our system, which is human detection. So human detection uses the YOLO V3 608 model to detect and track humans in the scene and then evaluates the different social distancing norms. So each of the detected persons is then classified into three classes, which is green, when the person is at a safe distance from all others, yellow, when the person is at a minimum safe distance from the others, but not at safe distance from the others, which is known as abnormal violation, and red when the person is not at the minimum safe distance from all the others. This is known as a serious violation. So we have used two different definitions of safe distance here to build our model. Minimum safe distance is one meter as set by the World Health Organization, and safe distance is two meters as set by several different countries. Now moving on to the third module of our system, which is alerts. So the alerts module of our system is connected to a Telegram bot using its chat ID and authenticated to it using the token ID. So alert messages can be delivered through this bot, both to individual users as well as to groups. Now, whenever there are any serious violations in COVID-19 norms, 
that are detected by our system, whether in social distancing or in face mask usage, then the same is communicated to the user's smartphone in real time by using this Telegram bot. Now moving on to the process. So our system workflow is divided into six distinct phases, which are video, pre-processing, model inference, calibration, output, and alerts. In the video phase, the video is captured from a source like an IP camera or CCTV, and then the frames are extracted to be sent on to the next phase, which is pre-processing. In this phase, pre-processing is done on the received frames, and then they are resized for model inference, and then they are sent to the next or the third phase, which is model inference. In model inference, the main detection task is performed on the frames that are received. Humans are detected as well as face mask detection is done. And the results from this phase is sent to the next phase, which is calibration. In calibration phase, it involves computing different parameters like social distancing and face mask metrics, then validating the same with the norms that have been laid by the health authorities and identifying if there are any violations. Now the result obtained from this calibration phase is sent to the next one, which is output phase. So in output phase, the output is generated in real time to the monitoring user, and it displays the different social distancing metrics, color-coded bounding boxes for person's detection and tracking, as well as face mask usage, and any kind of information regarding the violations that can be taking place in the scene. So now the information that is gathered from the output phase is sent on to the final one, that is the alerts phase. So if there are any serious violations taking place, which are detected by our system, then the same can be communicated to the monitoring user as an alert message by using a Telegram bot. So that forms the basis of the sixth and the final phase, the alerts phase. Now let's take a look at the real-time testing of our system. Now let's perform the real-time testing of our system Mavis AI on Jetson Nano. On executing the code, the window of our system Mavis AI COVID-19 norm surveillance system pops out and here in this window you can see there are two metrics at the right hand side we have a human counter and also masked improperly masked and unmasked counter and at the left side we have a metric in which it displays the serious violations and abnormal violations also the alerts are being displayed on the window let's play the video you can see as the pedestrian moves by, the alerts are being generated and the human count and the serious violations counters keeps on changing. Now we will be performing the live stream test using the, uh, using the webcam. The live stream has been started. The alerts are also displayed on the screen as well as we have created a telegram bot in which these alerts are directly sent to the user. Let's see if Arpan receives alerts on his smartphone or not. Yeah, Ritika, so here I got my smartphone and now I will just open up the telegram app so that we can use the bot for alerts. Yeah, so this is my chat with uh, the telegram bot which says um, mavis ai alerts here and you can see it's a blank screen right now and we have switched on the alerts right here so now uh, i'll wait and see if we can um, get the alerts on the phone so here's my phone and uh, yeah here comes the first alert so that's another one. So let's just uh, open it up. Yeah, so you can see here, we have started getting the others. The first one being for social distancing, second one for face mask. And now we got another third one, which says uh, social distancing threshold has been breached. 
So here we have the alerts which are coming on. This is the bot which is sending the alerts to our smartphone. Okay. So yeah, it's working fine. And we are getting the alerts um, in real time. Results. So as we saw, using Mavis AI, the user is able to monitor the social distancing norms and face mask usage in the scene captured by the surveillance camera and any breaches in the norm taking place in the scene is reported directly to the user as an alert message using our Telegram bot. Thus, our proposed system Mavis AI surpasses several limitations of the manual monitoring systems and provides an efficient and accurate way of monitoring and reporting breaches in COVID-19 norms. Now let's have a look on the performance of our different modules on Jetson Nano. Our first module, Face Mask Detection, uses Mask YOLO V4 Tiny Model. When this module is run on the CPU of Jetson Nano, we get a FPS rate of 1.37 to 1.77. Whereas when it runs on the GPU of Jetson Nano, we get a, we get a FPS rate of 3 to 6. Therefore, the performance of our module has increased on using the GPU of Jetson Nano. Similarly, when our second module, Human Detection and Tracking for Social Distancing, uses the model YOLO V3608 and runs on CPU, we get a FPS rate of 0.21, whereas on running on the GPU of Jetson Nano, we get the FPS rate as 0.71 to 0.79. Hence, on using the GPU of Jetson Nano, the performance of both the modules is increased. So integrating the two models into our system and doing the final testing on the Jetson Nano, we obtain the following performance figures. While doing the test run on the CPU, we get a frame rate of 0.15 to 0.2 FPS, while on the GPU, we get a frame rate of 0.65 to 0.83 FPS. So the inference is that our system Mavis AI utilizes the powerful GPU of Jetson Nano with CUDA backend to improve its performance by approximately four times better than that achieved on its CPU and runs at a frame rate of 0.65 to 0.83 FPS. Let's have a look into the application of our system. The primary application of our system Mavis AI is that it can be used as a COVID-19 norm surveillance system for monitoring both indoor and outdoor surveillance scenario. It can be used significantly in various busy places like in railway stations, airports, mega stores, malls, streets, etc., where manual monitoring is very difficult. Moreover, whenever there are violations in norms, monitoring authorities can be immediately alerted through the smartphones using the Telegram bot. Apart from COVID-19 norms, monitoring Mavis AI can be used for broader applications as generic human detection and tracking system in various real world applications. Thus, it can be significantly used as human action and anomaly detection in security systems like banks, ATMs, or even in residential areas. It can be used in autonomous vehicles as a pedestrian and detection model, and it can be used as a crowd management system in shops, lifts, public transports, etc. Let's look into the future work of our system. Our system's performance can be improved by using higher-end hardware and more optimized detection algorithms. Also, distance calculation can be made more accurate by using depth and aspect information. And in face mask detection module, we can use an advanced camera with zoom features and adjusting capability so that it can detect the distant faces. Lastly, we have here a few references from which we do our literature review, background research, and coded our modules. 
Finally, I would like to express our deepest gratitude and special thanks to Professor Jafar Sani for his constant support and guidance throughout the course of our project. Also, we would like to thank graduate assistant, Mr. Shinrei Yu, for his assistance and cooperation throughout the making of our project. And also, special thanks to Birla Institute of Technology, Mesra, that is our university, and Birla Institute of Technology, Mesra Alumni Association, North America, for providing us this great opportunity to be a part of this summer research immersion program at Illinois Tech, Chicago. And today I'll be doing my presentation on machine learning, aided squirrel detection and deterrence system for bird feeder. So the problem at hand is that homeowners are setting out bird feeders uh, intended to feed the birds in their garden or backyard, but squirrels are easily able to access them with their mobility and agility. Uh, they can climb up any poles, fences, trees to reach these bird feeders, and this scares away the scares away the birds. And this is something that unintended by the homeowners. And uh, we need to find a solution that's able to scare away those uh, squirrels without harming them. So one of the first things I researched was image analysis, and one of the techniques was thresholding. Thresholding is basically separating an image based on a certain threshold value that you set. So if you go by each pixel and if a pixel intensity is lower than that threshold image, then you would set it to let's say black. But if it's a, a higher than that uh, threshold value, you would set it to white. And this lets you simplify an image. Uh, so it's um, much easier to uh, uh, analyze. So one, it's also used to like separate foreground from background. As you can see in this image below on the bottom right, uh, the, we're able to easily separate the coins from the background table and this allows for easier um uh this allows you to easily count them and uh in the future we check their length and then identify how much or which coin it exactly is depending on their pixel length so the next technique that i researched was edge detection so edge detection works by detecting borders and outlines of an image based on detecting whether there's a quick change in brightness or contrast. So if some if an image uh, quickly jumps from white to black, we know that there is an edge or an outline in that uh, area. And there are many ways to do this with many algorithms. Uh, some listed are Sobel, Canny, Pruitt, Roberts, and Fuzzy, Fuzzy Logic. And as you can see, each one has a slightly different results and different algorithms are used for different images. So the main piece of hardware that I'm using for this project is the Jetson Nano. The Jetson Nano is a small computer which is designed for artificial intelligence and uh, video processing tasks. So it's something that uh, is very effective for the task that I'm trying to get done, which is uh, using AI and machine learning to detect squirrels through a live webcam. So uh, going along with deep learning and machine learning, uh, net neural networks are very important in that. Uh, to simply put, neural networks are made up of three components, the uh, input layer, hidden layers, which could be any amount of hidden layers, and output layer. So basically, you, in the input layer is what you feed the machine in, or you feed your data into the machine. In my case, it would be the pixels of each frame of the video. So there would be a node for each pixel. And those would uh, pass through the layers and in the and um, in the end, you would get an output. So in this, in my sense, I'm trying to classify uh, images or objects in the image. And so let's say for this example, I'm feeding, I'm trying to detect if there is a squirrel, a bird, or a dog. So my, those would be my three options in the output layer listed. And I would feed in the pixel image. They would pass through each layer and certain, based on the data, uh, certain nodes would pass the information along the layers, uh, depend decided by the activation function. And in the end, you would get um, basically like percentages that add up to one. And it shows you the comp what the machine thinks that the image is. So you would get for, let's say I pass in an image of a bird, 
uh, you would get 0.7 for the bird, 0.2 for um, a squirrel, and 0.1 for a dog. So the machine is more confident that it is a bird than anything else. Uh, one of the algorithms I'll be using for object detection is YOLO. Uh, YOLO is a really effective algorithm because it's able to detect multiple objects in a single frame. As you can see in the example, it's able to create multiple bounding boxes and label them each um, in this single frame. How YOLO works, simply put, it breaks the images into, uh, breaks it down with a grid. In this case, it's three by three. And it checks each grid for an object. Then it creates a bounding box around it. And then it finds, if, once an, if an object is detected, so in the seventh, a uh, square a uh, truck is detected or a car then it will label that image and decide what it is so for the on the jetson nano the first image recognition program i ran was uh using google net and it was trained with the image database image net so image net has over 14 million images with uh, almost over 20,000 sign sets indexed. And Google Net is a 22 layer deep convolutional neural network that's a variant of the inception network. And this was the first uh, program I ran with Justin Nano to detect and for image recognition. And here are some of the results. As you can see, it was very confident with um, uh, the apple detecting apples and squirrels and birds. Uh, just for reference that this is, it was not able to finish or fill all the text in this image. So this is a type of bird it was identifying. So the solution I came up with, I mentioned earlier, is uh, using machine learning with the Jansen Nano and training the system to recognize squirrels and then playing a sound through speakers to scare those uh, squirrels away when it is detected. Some of the hardware we will be using is the Jetson Nano plus supporting components, a webcam to detect the squirrels, speakers to play the sounds to the squirrels, and a power source to power. Uh, some of the software will be YOLO, which is the algorithm uh, object, object detection algorithm, COCO, which is the image data set that we'll be using to train YOLO, and uh, Python in general for uh, post uh, rest. Uh, this is a system diagram. Basically, the squirrel arrives at the bird feeder with video. The webcam catches it, sends the video to the Jetson Nano. The Jetson Nano takes that recording, recognizes that there's a squirrel, sends a signal to the speakers, and the speakers plays a sound to scare the squirrel away. Uh, for reflection and future work, one thing I was planning on changing was using the yellow detection algorithm because it is a uh, much more practical than uh, using the uh, ImageNet and GoogleNet because it is more likely that multiple objects will appear in the frames at a, at a time. And uh, YOLO is uh, designed to detect multiple objects in a complicated environment, which is something more ideal for that. Uh, I also plan to incorporate the speaker to the Judson Nano and test the effectiveness of squirrel detection in the real environment. Uh, here are my sources and thank you. Hi everyone, we will be presenting on mapping blood flow and vessel leakage in early detection of diabetes. Diabetes affects many parts of the body, one of it being the eye. There has been many researchers linking the flow of blood in the retina to the early detection of diabetic retinopathy. However, this research has been controversial. This is because the method used to determine the volume of blood flow is not quantitative. This research uses the kinetic modeling approach of measuring blood flow based on widely used method in dynamic contracts enhanced computer thermography. The model used in the research is based on linear system interpretations of fluorescent dynamics. Volumetric blood flow, F, is isolated from the relationship between input tissue functions of the system. The relationship between arterial inputs C sub A in bracket T and tissue concentration curve Q in bracket T is Q in bracket T equals F C in sub A in bracket T plus convolence R in bracket T. 
Iron to bracket T is the impulse res residue. Further mathematical calculations can be found in the paper and also on the slides. With this basic knowledge, the team was tasked to create an app or GUI on MATLAB, which brings together all isolated codes and data collected by re researchers over time. The first of the three graphical user interfaces is the Arterial Curve Analysis app. The GUI takes temporal dynamic fluorescent fluorescence data from a video and geography data set to form an arterial curve as seen on the left panel of the figure. Two fitting models are then used to create estimations of the blood flow rate denoted as F and the extraction fraction denoted as E based on five input parameters. The single window model utilizes the adiabatic approximation to the tissue homogeneity model to estimate vascular permeability across the first half of the arterial curve. In contrast, the three window employs both AATH and the box curve function across the entire curve of the data. An arbitrary set of E values can then be used to calculate both the bias and the mean squared error of both of the models used to view which one provides the better estimate of the two variables. A second window model, which would consider the second half of the arterial curve data, is currently in the works. The second GUI that we have made is for the retinal analysis. Users can import a data file and then set a mask by circling a small area of artery and then a small portion of vacant tissue. This mask denotes the two primary compartments for plotting and mapping. The first plots for blood flow data display the signal intensity over time for each compartment as well as showing leakage. This data is processed and then placed into the plots to show the mapping of EM and FM. The analysis itself uses the same AATH and boxcar algorithms as the arterial analysis. A resolution scale can be selected to group pixels together into larger subpixels to improve calculation time while sacrificing detail and precision. Shown in figure 4, we have the two fits for our blood flow data. As you can see, the tissue and leakage curves are relatively low in both cases, meaning there is a minimal amount of leakage. Figure 5 shows an imprecise version of the results typically found in a healthy patient. The low mean value of EM means there is low amounts of leakage in the arteries, as an expected value for a healthy patient is approximately 0.002. The plot of F is difficult to analyze due to the low resolution, though a more detailed plot would show a mapping of the flow of blood through the entire tissue. The main objective of this group project was to use our coding knowledge to create a unified GUI that combines an arterial curve analysis, retinal analysis, and a paired agent imaging model. We kept in mind the importance of simplicity and accuracy when creating this GUI so that practically any person could use it. This GUI makes it easy for researchers, medical staff, or clinicians to analyze their data without any previous knowledge of coding. The paired agent imaging technique involves the co-administration of a targeted imaging agent and a control imaging agent with the goal of quantitatively measuring drug target distribution and availability. This method could be implemented to validate or measure the leakage in the retina based on previous research conducted by Russ, Gaylord, and Hasselton. In addition, a GUI is currently being developed for the fluorescence imaging microscopy of cancer tissues. Lastly, an existing motion correction code can be implemented into this GUI to solve the issue of blinking and movement affecting the retinal imaging data. We would like to thank Dr. Ken Tischauer and Elif Nalbant for their help in developing this project, as well as the MIRC for allowing us to use their facilities. Hello. Today, I want to speak about my engineering immersion project that I conducted over summer 2021. The title of this project is Determining the Most Impactful Window-Related Optimization Method to Achieve Sustainability. My aim in doing this study was to demonstrate the importance of sustainability in buildings by showing the impact of making simple changes to the structure of windows in a sample office building. I achieved this goal by implementing a building energy modeling software de developed by Autodesk called Autodesk Inside 360. Whole building energy modeling software or BEM software collect data about a building structure and interior and exterior details to enable the users to create an optimized version of the structure. Windows are usually considered a decorative element of the facades of buildings. However, they are influential in the energy consumption of buildings. Furthermore, according to the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy in the United States alone, windows consume 30% of the building's uh, heating and cooling energy, representing an annual impact of 4.1 quadrillion BTU of primary energy. 
Therefore, finding a sustainable alternative to windows could significantly reduce the energy consumption of buildings, which is why it is the focus of this study. For research, I use window-related tools of Insight360 to create an optimized version of the structure and was able to reduce the energy cost mean by 2.9 USD per meter squared per year. Throughout this experience, I learned a lot about the concept of building and information modeling and building energy modeling and using Insight360. Insight360 is a great tool for aspiring engineers and architects to experience with BEM concepts and improve their knowledge to apply later in their career. My suggestions for further studies in this topic are for buildings located in other cities or states um, and including Insight360 building orientation tool in addition to the window tools to display how it impacts the optimization of the windows of different directions and the building overall. Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Anisha Manivanan and I'm a chemical engineering student. My presentation is on photocatalytic conversion of carbon dioxide to hydrocarbon fuels. Of the total energy used globally, 80% is supplied by fossil fuels. While fossil fuels are inexpensive, easy to transport and store, reliable, and have high energy density, there are also limited resources and severe environmental impacts. When fossil fuels are burned, carbon dioxide is released in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have significantly increased, which has led to climate change. Renewable energy and nuclear power are alternatives to fossil fuels, which will help reduce the effects of carbon in the atmosphere. Solar energy is a renewable energy source that is relatively low cost, but is weather dependent and cannot be stored. A solution is the photochemical CO2 reduction reaction. In this carbon neutral cycle, carbon dioxide is first harvested from the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide then gets reduced in a photochemical reaction. This process stores the solar energy in chemical bonds as fuel. The energy in the chemical bonds then gets released when burned. This fuel is converted to carbon dioxide when burned, which starts the cycle again. The cycle is carbon neutral because the carbon dioxide produced at the end of the cycle is used to start the reaction again. The photocatalytic reduction of carbon dioxide is a redox reaction that is accelerated due to a catalyst being present. In the reaction, the first step is that a photon is absorbed by a photosensitizer. Once the pho photosensitizer becomes excited, it moves to a higher orbital and electron transfer occurs. Finally, the catalytic reaction occurs on the surface of the photocatalyst. There are different catalysts that can be used, which offer different product yields. Some challenges of photocatalytic carbon dioxide re reduction is that this reaction competes with other, more favorable reactions, such as water reduction in the process. In addition, because CO2 exists mainly in a gaseous state in the atmosphere, the photocatalyst needs to be able to absorb it in order to react. There is also uncertainty in the product selectivity of each catalyst, as there is not a clear mechanism that occurs. Carbon dioxide is extremely stable, so in order to reduce it, a large amount of energy is needed. 43% of solar energy is distributed in the visible light region, so the most effective catalysts need to have a band gap between 1.7 and 3.1 electron volts to capture that energy. Band gap is the energy between the highest occupied molecular orbital in the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Band gap is a, in, is a really important way to distinguish between different catalysts. Catalysts can be doped with other materials to tune the band gap to the desired range. Titanium dioxide is a strong, highly stable catalyst, which has a higher band gap of 3.2 electron volts, so is more efficient when combined with another catalyst. The doped metals help diminish the charge recombination by acting as an electron sink which then traps the electrons and stabilizes the charge separation. When the charge separation is stable, the photocatalytic properties of the material are improved. Nitrogen, iron, and rhodium are promising materials to be combined with titanium dioxide to bring the band gap down. Graphitic carbon nitride has a band gap already in the range of visible light and is highly stable. The band gap further decreases when it is doped with silver phosphate, sulfur, and cadmium sulfide. Graphitic carbon nitride is promising due to its photocatalytic activity. Metal sulfides are useful because the conduction band has d orbitals of transition metals, which is very reductive compared to metal oxides. 
The valence band is made of three p orbitals of the sulfur atoms, which is less positive than oxygen atoms. So the band gap of semiconductors made of sulfur are narrower than metal oxides, and they naturally absorb visible light. One drawback is that it has a lower stability during the photocatalytic process. Cadmium sulfide is well studied and has a band gap in the visible light region. Metal sulfides also can be doped with other materials to tune the band gap. The effect of doping with different materials on effective base catalysts have been identified for optimal band gap results. In the future, a catalyst will be determined to further analyze and experiments will be conducted for activity and selectivity analyses. The CO2 reduction process will also be fine-tuned for greater efficiency. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone. I am Shubham Adhikari from Birla Institute of Technology, Mesra, India. I am an undergraduate of Electrical and Electronics Engineering. During my period as a research intern in Illinois Institute of Technology, I worked with Dr. Erdal Oruklu on reconfigurable hardware design for signal processing applications. The most efficient and economical approach for determining flaws in structures or materials such as bridges, buildings is through non-destructive testing. Ultrasonic signal plays a major role when it comes to non-destructive evaluation of materials. However, the analysis and evaluation of an ultrasonic data is remarkably challenging. The clutter echoes resulting from the microstructure of materials often mask the flaw. However, it is possible to achieve clutter decorrelation by frequency diversification. Subband decomposition, also known as split spectrum processing, is an effective technique for obtaining the frequency diverse signals. After the reception of the echo from the sample under test, it passes through an analog to digital converter. The A scan is a one dimensional data which contains information of clutter echoes and flaw echo. The A scan then passes through the fast Fourier transform block where the A scan is converted into its corresponding frequency spectrum. The frequency spectrum is then divided into various sub frequency bands by the sub band filters. Inverse fast Fourier transform is applied to each sub-frequency band to generate their corresponding time domain signals. These signals from each frequency band are then normalized before passing them on to the post-processor block. The post-processor combines all the normalized signals coming from each channel to reconstruct the original time domain signal but with an improved FCR. FCR which is short for flaw to clutter ratio serves as the criterion to check the improvement of the flaw visibility. The flaw is more dominant in the low frequency region rather than the high frequency region. Hence, the maximization of FCR highly depends on the number of channels, the size of the filters and their degree of overlap. The FCR is calculated for the original data and also after the minimization and average post processors. It is found that the FCR is greatly improved for an ultrasonic scan having a good FCR originally and also for an ultrasonic signal having a very poor FCR originally. It can be concluded that both minimization and average post processors improve the flaw visibility to a great extent and also that the minimization post processor is the most effective order statistics method as compared to all other conventional order statistics method. Future work would include implementing a neural networks post processor which is even better than the minimization post processor and embedding this algorithm onto an FPGA platform for real time evaluation of ultrasonic data. That would be all from my side. I would like to thank Dr. Erdal Oruklu for giving me this opportunity to work under him on this project. Thank you. Um, hi there. Hi there. Uh, my name is Saad Aziz Zaidi. I'm an undergrad at Billa Institute of Technology, Mesra. Uh, my intensive summer research program was medical devices and sensors. I was being advised to it all by the amazing Dr. Abhinav Bhushan. The topic that I chose for my project was point of care device for diagnosing periodontitis. The goal of this project was to explore the possible alternatives to traditional methods of uh, testing for periodontitis, in particular point of care tests. Uh, as of 2012, chronic periodontitis is a major health problem in all societies and is um, estimated to affect 47% of the adult US population more than 30 years old, with 38% 
uh, having severe or moderate disease. Diagnosis of disease activity is critical in disease management. However, conventional clinical indices used to define periodontal cases, such as probing depth, clinical attachment loss, and bleeding on probing are poor predictors of disease progression. Traditional clinical diagnostic methods are complex and expensive and cannot meet these requirements. With more biomarkers and development of new technologies, various point of care tests platforms have been developed for periodontitis diagnosis and monitoring. These are easy to perform, rapid, low cost, and are perfectly suited for high frequency diagnosis of periodontitis at the point of care. Here, as we can see um, near the gingival margin, if you, if you can look at the gingival margin uh, right here, um, um, uh, this is where the bacteria will first collect, eventually ending up in the surrounding tissue, uh, the tissue that it's, uh, the, the, the teeth is surrounding, surrounding tissue, causing inflammation and given some time, bone loss. Now, periodontitis is also related to systemic diseases such as atherosclerosis, diabetes, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. Although periodontitis is uh, generally goes through a long, slow developmental process, but without no noticeable some symptoms, permanent damage can be induced if patients miss the best opportunity for effective treatment, which is why point of care tests are so important. Um, in the spirit of exploration, I um, I looked into dental impressions as a possible collection method uh, that can simultaneously collect samples from all teeth and also have a record of the exact place of the sample. The reason dental impression seemed so promising was that, as you can see here, to take an accurate impression, the material must go into the gingival margin near the subgingival plaque. This means that the impression material is coming into contact here, as you can see, it's coming into contact uh, uh, with the uh, with all three biofluids, uh, saliva, GCF, and also the subgingival plaque. But then the problem is, uh, how would you get the sample out of the uh, out of the impression? Right, rinsing it off would mean losing the location aspect of it and obtaining a general overview kind of sample of the parents, patient's mouth. Another alternative uh, was paper strips, obviously, uh, as you can see here. Uh, these paper strips are placed in an individual uh, teeth, and which is why, uh, like, uh, the alternative paper strips. Uh, are present but they allow collection from only one tooth at a time after collection the strips are placed in append off tubes and centrifuged to elude the gcf's components point of care testing still has a long way to go to be dependable enough to be actively used uh, in um, in clinical environments i believe the future uh, for periodontitis point of care test rests in using a bunch of biomarkers synergistically uh, interacting with one another and not individually because periodontitis is a result of a very complex interaction I think and I think uh, we should go the same way um, thank you Hello, my name is Jeremy. Hello, my name is Casey. And this is our presentation on modeling unsteady aerodynamic systems. Aerospace vehicles and airflow fields represent unsteady systems whose aerodynamic properties are affected by varying angles of attack. Equations of motion can accurately represent the aerodynamic properties of these systems. Unsteady aerodynamic systems can experience variations in lift and drag forces with different angles of attack alpha. Current software, such as the Julia package that we use, can utilize algorithms to accurately model these systems. The aerodynamic shapes considered for this study was a thin plate. The angles varied from 0 and 10, and from 10 to 15 degrees with increments of 1. The Reynolds number was set to 200, and the motion was defined using oscillatory pitch heap kinematics. The system was defined as a set of Navier-Stokes equations depending on Reynolds number, the grid spacing delta x, the time step size delta t, the domain limits, the aerodynamic shape, the specified motion, and the velocity of the flow. In the study, the vorticity fields and graphs of the lifts and drag forces as a function of angle of attack were collected over a specified time interval of five units. So the images on the right 
most box represent the airfoil um, in each of the cases that we measured for each angle of attack that we studied. Um, and the red and the blue um, lines respectively represent uh, the vortexes flowing over and under the leading edge of the wing. Uh, so with different angles of attack, um, we noticed different patterns in those vortexes and how they flowed. Um, there was a little bit of flow separation and uh, we also noticed um, that they produce different amounts of wake. Um, so in the bottom middle um, section of our poster, you can see that we plotted uh, the lift force versus angle of attack and drag force versus angle of attack. And along with current research, our results prove that with higher angles of attack, um, the lift force and the drag forces increased. Future work may also consider aerodynamic forces over the full cycle of pitching and heaving instead of specified cycle. They may also consider multiple airfoils that are pitching and heaving in tandem. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> Hello, my name is Andrew Bland, and I have been researching a dust mitigation system for a lunar surface habitat module. The idea came from reading about the unique problems faced with the charged lunar dust particles, such as interfering with scientific instruments and the hazards that can arise from inhaling it for a long period of time. Uh, there have been a lot of new technologies to mitigate uh, the dust on scientific instruments, such as the solar panels used, uh, but there have been very little advancements on the technology to mitigate the dust inside of a habitat. The current state of the art utilizes oppositely charged wands uh, waved on a spacesuit upon arrival from a space mission, or a moonwalk in particular, uh, sticky floors to trap the dust. However, none of these methods deemed very effective, and they would decrease over a longer mission, uh, deeming them ultimately ineffective uh, over the longer missions, which is the goal. Uh, this inspired me to develop a way to collect and mitigate the amount of lunar particulate in the air of a habitat module. Due to the lunar regolith's charge, much of the dust floats above the surface to an extent of about 36 inches. This charge can be utilized to attract the dust into a filtration system, uh, different than the way a vacuum would work on Earth, where it uses airflow. Uh, the idea is to create an autonomous vacuum-like contraption to attract the dust particles from the air and contain it. And this system would use filtration an air filtration system and LiDAR sensors to safely navigate about the habitat. Once a prototype is developed, the two state-of-the-art air filtration systems, the HEPA and the graphene filters, would be tested to determine which is the best for a lunar regolith uh, by using a lunar regolith uh, simulant mixture containing an array of grain sizes to most accurately uh, test what they would be used for. And in my research, I have found that the graphene filters would work better. However, they would need to be replaced and cleaned more uh, frequently than the HEPA, uh, which would come into uh, play in determining the most optimal filter system uh, when dealing with the weight of the overall filters needed and things like that, which have been a big concern, considering it's very expensive to send one pound of payload into the space.
Hello everyone, I'm Sharanya Shah from Birla Institute of Technology, Mesa, India. My uh, discipline is chemical engineering. During my period as a research intern in Illinois Institute of Tech, I worked with Dr. Professor Abhinav Bhushan on the topic of effects of hyperbaric hypoxia on the functions of our brain. When we talk about hyperbaric hypoxia, we necessarily confine ourselves to the expeditions into space and what happens when these astronauts go on these manned missions and face the problems of hypoxia, which is a deficiency in oxygen, hyperbarically, which is a deficiency of pressure. So there's a pressure deficiency, there is oxygen deficiency. Cumulatively, they affect the brain in multiple ways. Um, so this is one of the, uh, this, is, this comes under the theme of human health engineering. And my project objective and goal was to address some of the unmet needs of the topics, such as visual impairment syndrome. Now, when we talk about affecting the brain, there are lots of areas in the brain that get affected. But what intrigued me the most was this particular ophthalmic region, which gets affected due to hyperbaric hypoxia and which happens due to an increase in the intracranial pressure, which in turn increases the accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid. And all this combined uh, reduces the uh, uh, vision and uh, also promotes all the impairment that takes place in the eye. Not only this, hyperbaric hypoxia also leads to a lot of sensory motor degrading uh, functions. They also lead to stress and uh, immune suppressive effects of space flight. Now, uh, the background as such is that NASA has been trying to address some of the uh, some of the unmet needs, but has not yet come up with a concrete solution. Although research has been continuously being done in the human health sector, but the actual extravehicular activity and the actual research about the visual impairment syndrome has been not been addressed as of now. So uh, I, I decided to address this topic because eyes or vision is one of the most important uh, sensory uh, functions that as humans we do. So even a slight effect on the negative side can uh, have uh, can have people losing their vision for years or maybe they go completely blind so with that a slight background into what is normobaric and what is hypobaric hypoxia normobaric is a uh, deficiency of oxygen in the brain due to normal conditions at earth and the intensity of normobaric hypoxia is much much less uh, as compared to uh, the intensity of uh, deficiency of oxygen in space. So hyperbaric hypoxia is a much, much exaggerated, aggravated, accentuated uh, function operation uh, that affects the brain in multiple ways. Uh, in order to combat the particular problem at hand, I have a four step approach, which is firstly uh, the non-medicinal approach that is having multiple tests before going into space like visual acuity, retinal imagery, uh, low flattening and optic nerve sheet dis distension over time. So NASA can use all these tests and along with a particular uh, test called OCT, which is optical coherence tomography. It's like an MRI, but of the eye. Uh, they can use these tests to actually check the pre and post flight uh, eye conditions. The second is to, uh, this is the second is uh, one of the things that people can do on the manned mission. That is uh, uh, bringing themselves into a space of uh, negative pressure, which diffuses the pressure in the intracranial portion to the other parts of the body. Apart from all these, we can use flavonoids, mainly NGEN, which is narginine, and quercetin, that is PUR. Uh, they have antioxidant properties. They are neuroprotective in nature, and upon uh, consumption, they can easily uh, help us combat hyperbaric hypoxia. So my conclusions are uh, evidently mentioned in the conclusions portion. Further studies can be hydroponic system development, biogenerative system development in this case. Uh, that will be all for my side. I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Abhinav Bhushan, for giving me this opportunity to work with him. And also I'd like to thank my fellow research interns, Anil Kumar, Brennan Shapiro, and Andrew Glenn, with their insights and with their uh, research works as well. I learned a lot about the matter and uh, the references have been cited. Please feel free to reach out to me and please feel free to drop any questions that you have. Thank you so much.
historic fatigue case studies. The following is a compilation of the most unique and historic fatigue case studies through history. In the upper left, William Albert in 1829 was serving as superior mining supervisor in Germany. Wilhelm observed and tested iron mine chain hoists. He built a machine to repeatedly load the hoist and as a result found failure to be based on load and repetition. In 1834, he invented a twist steel cable as a result. In 1837, he published one of the first articles on fatigue. Below that, the Versailles train crash occurred in 1842 in Versailles, France. An axle on the lead locomotive broke and derailed uh, resulting in a pileup which caught fire and caused the death of at least 55 people due to the practice of locking passengers in train cars. This led to a systematic study of failure by the likes of H.H. H. Edwards, William Rantine, and William Fairbairn. Much of the preliminary work on fatigue centers around train components. Below that, the Great Molasses Flood of 1919 occurred in Boston, Massachusetts. During the Prohibition era, a distillery containing 13,000 tons of molasses burst, resulting in 25-foot waves going 35 miles per hour through the streets, killing 21 and injuring 150. Investigations uncovered poor construction and testing of the storage vessel, steel half as thick as needed, and fatigue failure at the rivet holes as a result of constant fluctuation of temperature and pressure. Construction regulations were updated to include oversight by licensed engineers and architects. At the bottom left, the de Havilland Comet failure of 1954 occurred over the Mediterranean Sea. This is the world's first commercial jet airliner featuring pressurized cabins and square windows. Within 12 months, three comet jets catastrophically failed in flight. Extensive testing revealed fatigue failures in two of the jets, caused by repeated pressurization and depressurization. This led to redone, redesigns in the jet, which were adopt, adopted by the airline industry. The silver bridge shown in the middle failed in 1967 over the Ohio River. The bridge spanned the Ohio River carrying 4,000 vehicles per day. Failure was traced to a small fatigue crack in an I-bar loop, which caused a chain reaction failure. This has spurred the establishment of the National Bridge Inspection Standards. Below that, Los Angeles Airways Flight 417 crashed in 1968 in Compton, California. The main rotor separated, uh, resulting in loss of control, which killed all on board. Fatigue due to high cycles, 11,864 flight hours, and a combination of improper shot peening, poor metal hardness, and pitting was the cause of fatigue failure. In the investigations by the NTSB resulted in the adoption of more stringent inspections and life cycle analysis of rotor parts. Below that, the Alexander L. Keeland oil platform capsized in 1980 in the North Sea, Norway. All anchor cables snapped and the drilling rig capsized, causing the death of 123 people. Investigations into failure were traced back to a non-structural fillet weld containing lamellar tearing and cold cracks. The cyclic nature of the winds and waves alongside the poor weld resulted in fatigue failure of the supports. Up at the top right, the Mianus River Bridge failed in 1983 in Greenwich, Connecticut. This bridge on I-95 carried 100,000 vehicles per day. Failure was traced to a pin hanger connection, which corroded and then caused a fatigue crack. 
at the time there was inadequate inspection capabilities with only 12 engineers to cover 3,425 bridges in the state. Below that, the Aschetti derailment occurred in 1998 in Germany. A high-speed train derailed, killing 101 people and injured 88. It was caused by a single fatigue crack failure, which locked the wheels of the train into a different path than intended at a junction point. The, the train attempted to go down two different tracks. Fatigue was fatigue failure occurred as a result of resonance and severe vibrations. Fatigue was further exacerbated by the plastic deformation or flattening of wheels during revolution. No facilities at the time existed to be able to test the failure limits of this wheel. Below that is the Sayano Shushinkaya power station, which failed in 2009 in Russia. Vibrations in turbine 2 resulted in fatigue failure of bolts holding the turbine cover. 20 atmospheres of water pressure launched the turbine from the casing, flooding and destroying the building and nearby turbines. Two buildings flooded, two turbines were flooded, five moderately severely damaged, three completely destroyed, and two transformer explosions and many deaths. Thoughts and observations. Small fatigue failures can cause catastrophic events, as can be seen in several of these case studies. Research, testing, inspection, detection, and accurate life cycle analysis are invaluable failure prevention and life safety tools. Structural fatigue failure prediction. Fatigue is a mechanism that occurs due to cyclic loading oftentimes at loads within allowable design criteria. Microstructural damage occurs with each cycle, and when enough damage accumulates, fatigue failure occurs. This makes fatigue an important consideration for any structure subject to cyclic loading. The fatigue phenomena starts with crack initiation. The crack initiation occurs at an atomic level around defects in the material. Many microcracks form and develop over a comparatively longer period of time than crack propagation. When a dominant crack forms, we have moved from the crack initiation phase to the crack propagation phase. This crack elongates until sufficient cross-sectional area loss occurs, resulting in rupture. Compared to initiation, propagation is considerably shorter. Shown below in the lower left is an example of fatigue failure. You can see the site of the crack initiation to the right of the gray cylinder. With each cycle, cracks propagate as can be seen by the benchmarks. Finally, when the crack is propagated far enough, a fracture occurs. The fatigue failure mechanism occurs due to some degree of imperfections, such as voids, cracks, insertion, and deletions. During cyclic loading, stress set imperfections are significantly higher than the rest of the part. Shown in the diagram in the middle are three common modes of fatigue failure, opening, in-plane shear, and out-of-plane shear. The highest stress concentrations occur at the tips of the cracks in each case. This mechanism is why fatigue failure can occur at loads within allowable design criteria. Because cyclic loading causes damage to the material until failure, the crack initiation method can be used to both estimate relative damage as well as remaining fatigue life. Using an experimentally obtained SN curve or stress range to cycle relationship, we can quantify the likely number of cycles that will occur before failure at particular levels of stress range. Using the information in combination with real-time data, we can estimate at what point a sample is in its life cycle, as well as the remaining fatigue life. A typical SN curve is shown below in the middle with stress range plotted on the y-axis and cycles plotted on the x-axis. The left of the end of the curve represents low cycle fatigue, 
and that at high stress ranges, there are comparatively low amounts of cycles to failure than the right side of the curve. The right end of the curve shows high cycle fatigue and that the stress range is low, resulting in many cycles to failure when compared to the left end of the curve. Some materials may display asymptotic behavior, which corresponds to theoretical limits to high and low cycle fatigue. There are many significant case studies on fatigue, such as the Great Molasses Flood, the de Havilland Comet, the Silver Bridge, and the Achete Derailment, and many other, others covering a large variety of structures and components. Be depicted in the photo at the upper right is one that is close to home and quite current. You can see in the photo a significant crack close to the point of failure on Lakeshore Drive Bridge just two years ago. Although we've been studying for fatigue for nearly 200 years, we can see that it's far from solved. Fatigue failure needs to be a consideration on all structures subject to cyclic loading. Mitigating risks means developing more accurate fatigue models and methods to aid in the, in the design and inspection of structures. And accurate fatigue life prediction enables us to prioritize structural repairs. Hello everyone, my name is Madiha Kanwal and my partner name is Kathleen Grave. And we are going to present our project on analysis of millimeter wave radar and its applications. We are going to covering today, identifying millimeter wave radar applications, evaluating TIAWR 1642 boost millimeter wave evaluation board and the purpose of our uh, system um, for millimeter wave radar and machine vision fusion for pedestrian collision and warning. What are radar systems? So radar system locate object by transmitting electromagnetic waves. They use received reflective waves so to determine object position, velocity and angle of deviation. Recently, there has been a lot of research with millimeter wave radar sensor and um, Due to their smaller wavelength, uh, they can detect movement as small as millimeter. What are some applications of uh, millimeter wave? One of the most common applications can be found in autonomous vehicles like Tesla, Volkswagen, and uh, we have um, autom autonomous vehicles, and we have factory and building automation, medical imaging, safety and security, 
we have emergency response, crowd control, and occupancy detection. So why we use millimeter wave radars? Some of the common benefits are they are adaptable to environmental conditions such as lightning and fog, and they provide privacy, high precision, and accurate location, angle, and velocity detection. These are few examples of millimeter wave and machine vision hybrid solutions. For example, child present detection, driver drowsiness and detection, obstacle detection. Millimeter waves can pass through materials such as plastic, clothing, or even if they are covered by blankets. So camera-based passenger detection is useful in most of the scenarios, but radar works as add-on by providing accuracy and flexibility and result in safer and smarter driving decisions. Future implementation, uh, we are proposing a warning system to alert drivers of incoming pedestrian using image processing and deep learning for pedestrian classification and using millimeter waypoint clouds to obtain accurate pedestrian position. My partner will go into details and system features. So as just mentioned, our system will identify pedestrians in a camera's field of view and then accurately map their relative location using a millimeter wave radar to determine if there is a risk of collision. To, <clears throat> to determine the position of the pedestrians in AWR 1642 boost ODS millimeter wave sensor from Texas Instruments will be used to capture the relative 3D coordinates and velocity of the objects. Uh, cluttering and static clutter, or clustering and static clutter removal will be performed to distinguish the people from the objects. And then to classify pedestrians, a convolutional neural network will be used on the captured camera image. Um, both the hardware components will be connected to a NVIDIA Jetson Nano, which will run the Python program that processes the data and determines the results. Uh, Texas Instruments software will also be used in order to program the AWR, uh, such as their millimeter wave SDK and Code Composer Studio. Here are some specifications on the AWR 1642 boost evaluation module. Um, this module is a frequency modulated continuous wave radar um, that operates at 77 gigahertz. It has an onboard digital signal processor and ARM Cortex-R4 processor. Um, the onboard antenna is an array uh, of four receive and two transmit antennas, which allows for that 3D capability. However, the model we'll be using uh, is the ODS, which is a wide field of view antenna structure. And this is ideal for near range 3D spaces because it's able to capture 180 degrees. The evaluation board has two main configurations, the uh, short range radar and ultra short range radar. The short range radar detects up to 80 meters and the ultra short range can detect up to 20. Um, there are also some other characteristics to consider when trying to decide uh, between the two configurations uh, besides for distance. Um, for example, the ultra short range is able to provide higher resolution and can detect finer movements, but the short range radar can detect higher velocities. Uh, in order to test the capabilities of the AWR evaluation board, we first ran some of Texas Instruments pre-designed demonstrations. Um, the first one being obstacle detection within five meters of the sensor. In these demonstrations, the wall is also being detected as an extra object, which, um, which is why there's always an extra cluster in the results. The obstacle detection program showed promising accuracy when it comes to detecting the ob objects. Um, it can even distinguish between two objects that are placed very close together. 
The second demonstration we performed uh, is TI's high accuracy range detection. This demo can measure range to the accuracy of millimeters due to the zoom fast Fourier transform that is being performed uh, during the data processing. In the test that we performed, uh, we placed multiple objects in front of the sensor. Um, the wall had the greatest reflection of the electromagnetic waves, and therefore it created the highest peak in the range profile. Um, the measurement that was found was 2.0074 meters, which is very high precision as we expected. So up until this point, we have completed the preliminary research and hardware evaluation testing. However, our actual goal is still a work in progress. We would like to be able to create a prototype of the proposed uh, millimeter wave machine vision fusion system for pedestrian collision warning. Um, so we believe by pairing the machine vision with the millimeter wave radar depth profiling, we can increase the safety operations of vehicles and also protect uh, pedestrians. Uh, thank you for listening to our presentation. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Simrat. I'm Rajesh. And we are here to present our Summer 2021 Grad Research Immersion Project that we've been working on. So the name of our project is Sleep Tune. It is a sleep and relaxation therapy using AI and brainwave entrainment. Our advisor has been Dr. Jaffas Eni, and our technical support has been uh, from Shinrei Yu. So, so we are getting, going to deal with the problems of people inability to sleep well. Uh, our objective is to solve problems by developing a brainwave and auditory interactive system to help uh, people suffering from sleep deprivation and uh, disorder relax and, and they will sleep better. So how do we do that? So we'll go and uh, see something of background. Okay, so uh, we'll start with the uh, lymphatic systems. So many of us are relatively familiar with the lymphatic system. It performs a number of roles, one of which is clearing the metabolism waste from the gap between the cells, referred to as, as the in intercellular space. However, the central nervous system, which comprises the brain and the spinal cord, does not have any true lymphatic vessels. Because of the CNN is highly active, metabolism waste can build up quickly. The CNN is also very sensitive to the fluctuation in the environment. So the body needs to remove the cellular garbage somehow. That's where the lymphatic comes in. If the cellular system become overloaded or uh, slow down as we age, metabolism garbage would build up between the cells. The garbage includes the products such as uh, beta amyloid, the protein associated with the Alzheimer's disease. So, um, uh, and this lymphatic, uh, uh, lymphatic system works better when you sleep. Okay, so in layman terms, the brain takes the trash out while we sleep. It's very similar to defragmentation in computer science. Now, how severe is the problem? Uh, you might have noticed that if, you, uh, if you're unable to sleep one night, your next day can be uh, quite troublesome. You have trouble concentrating. So uh, imagine prolonged periods of sleep deprivation. It affects memory, it retains toxin buildup, it causes cognitive impairment, mental disorders, immunity disorders, and physical disorders like uh, it raises chances of having a heart disease or diabetes. Uh, some of the problems uh, that are related to uh, sleep are insomnia, sleep apnea, and uh, even uh, if if, uh, uh, if, if uh, sleep uh, if if a child is uh, deprived of sleep and it is it goes untreated, they can uh, uh, develop autism at a later stage. So it is uh, a, a cause of concern even for kids. Now the signs of sleep. Uh, sleep is basically classified into two broad types, that is rapid eye movement sleep, that is REM sleep, and non-REM sleep. Non-REM sleep is uh, further divided into four stages. Stage one, that is, uh, that, uh, that is uh, the stage from uh, transitioning stage, uh, from wakefulness to sleep. Stage two, uh, the mind goes deeper into the sleep. Stage three and four are the deepest stage of uh, sleep. Now, types of sleep patterns. Uh, like, I, uh, like I discussed earlier, uh, our sleep starts from stage 1 and goes up to uh, down to stage 2 
uh, and, and then we go into deeper stage three and stage four, and then we come out of it and we go into an REM sleep. That is the fifth stage of sleep. So this cycle continues and uh, one cycle consists of uh, 90 minutes of uh, uh, time period. Now, uh, some uh, basic definitions and patterns of sleep. Uh, slow wave sleep. This is uh, basically the deep sleep that is uh, uh, represented in the stage three and stage four. It mainly consists of uh, dead activity. Um, then uh, REM sleep is the rapid eye movement sleep. Now this is the stage where uh, you are uh, dreaming in the sleep and your body is very um, uh, sensitive to the external stimuli. Then we have alpha activities. Alpha activity is related to stage one of sleep. Uh, the frequency ranges of alpha activity are from 8 hertz to 12 hertz, roughly. And uh, then there is theta activity, that is stage 2. Uh, the frequency range is from 4 to 7 hertz. This is the stage where uh, your learning and your memory is boosted up. Then there is delta activity, that is the deepest stage of sleep. Uh, this occurs in uh, stage 3 and stage 4, and uh, it ranges from 0.5 to 3 hertz. Okay, so how do we... Uh interpret these waves for example if if we, we have uh, please an electron around the brains and if you uh, tap a signal from the front run or 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 a uh, side knobs or 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 from any of the nodes if, if you see the gamma waves then we can identify as similar as already mentioned we can identify with the frequency so we have to just free, filter out the frequency in order to understand about the each waves for example gamma waves are high frequency waves and beta waves are and each wave corresponds to a, a defined objective for example the gamma waves are used for the intense learning and if you want to uh, if somebody is doing a problem solving and engaging then the beta waves and the alpha is for recharging and the theta is for dreaming and the delta is for dreamers so uh, as like uh, uh, any embedded system when when the system is not using it that's when we are sleeping it in order to reduce the power our body itself will reduce the frequency and it makes to utilize less power from the body okay so we will see the block diagram of uh, our sleep tube so we have uh, uh, EEG, that is we use our uh, uh, NeuroSky headband as a EEG device, which is used to collect these waves and it's being given to our pre-processing ML logic. Where the pre-processing stage filter out these data in order to identify it, it into a, a gamma, beta and delta waves. And these are these waves information and the and the information and filtered information are given to the CNN network. Now the CNN is having a one convolution layer and batch normalization to minimize the shift and, and the robustness of the model and the max coding layer with a normal sampling factor of two between each layer. We have used a rectilinear linear unit is used for the activation function. Finally, a fully connected layer with a softmax activation function is used to the compute the probability of each classes and weight are learned using the Adam optimizer. And these output are classified and given to our processing unit. This processing unit, depending on the output, it will generate a binomial or multi-tone or single tone. And these tones are sent through the audio jack and it will reach to the head with the help of a headphone. Now, uh, the, as, as we give a different tones, we, we could be able to see again using our headbands, the different waves orientation and the waves changing spectrum. So as we, it changes, it has been again feedback to the processing unit. So it is like a feedback loop. And as the loops try to learn about the wave, and it will give you a more optimized waves binomial tones to your headphones. And, and uh, it will also uh, um, uh, take the delta waves and you will feel drowsy. Okay, so this is our uh, progress update uh, till date. Uh, we have uh, uh, analysis uh, of uh, EEG data sets that is available to us. And uh, we are uh, on the, currently we are building a pre-processing machine learning uh, tool for our classification for real-time data. And uh, we have completed uh, uh, generating a, a binaural tone and solfeggio uh, frequency generator. And uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, completed an interface between Jetson Nano and headphones uh, to screen different frequencies. Uh, now, next in line is uh, uh, building this uh, convolutional, uh, convolutional uh, neural network to classify different brainwaves. And then we'll interface with Jetson Nano and uh, henceforth we'll move forward. Okay, so here we are, uh, when we start collecting the EEG data format, we are all already having a lot of formats for collecting data. So here we are going to um, read with the help of uh, EDF, that is electronic data format, and the fractal image format. These are the two uh, EEG data format through which we are able to collect the data set. 
and also for the training of this data, we are using a Kaggle. So we have a different uh, varieties of data like EEG analysis for the sleep pattern, EEG alive for the data, alpha based pre-processing of EEG data. These all are used to learn the CNN network and we could able to classify each, each uh, waves. Okay, now how to bring this react to audio. Uh, whenever you tune into any tone, any fre at any frequency, your brain will automatically synchronize to that frequency. And this theory is uh, used to uh, help uh, to uh, 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 load uh, binaural tones into our uh, through our auditory system, uh, so that our brains uh, brain synchronizes with uh, in, into a, a relaxative and a meditative state. And uh, this whole process of uh, uh, the brain adapting to your frequency of sound is called brainwave entrainment, and uh, we are using this technique to uh, help uh, generate uh, alpha waves and uh, uh, lower frequency waves, so that uh, we are able to relax the brain, and uh, hence uh, we are able to uh, uh, help people to, uh, into uh, falling asleep and uh, feeling drowsy or falling asleep. Now, how do you uh, choose the frequencies? Uh, like we've already discussed, we have uh, different fre frequencies for different stages of sleep. So uh, we'll use uh, delta frequencies for deep relaxation and deep sleep, and uh, theta for uh, shorter naps. Alpha frequencies we use for relaxation and for meditative purposes. Uh, then going forward, we can uh, include beta frequencies also, which are uh, slightly higher frequency range, uh, which can uh, increase uh, uh, work performance and concentration. Now, uh, there is uh, something called as solfeggio frequencies. Uh, these are some ancient uh, frequencies uh, that are used for therapeutic and uh, for healing purpose. Uh, they're also uh, uh, related to uh, sound healing therapy and uh, there has been a lot of scientific research uh, in, in recent years around uh, solfeggio frequencies and their effectiveness and they're also called uh, Schumann's uh, resonance frequency. Uh, this is basically a, a low, uh, low frequency uh, Schumann uh, resonance point around the earth uh, and uh, so uh, uh, yes, uh, th there are some uh, set of frequencies uh, that uh, you can use for different uh, purposes. And also there has been uh, uh, some studies that show that uh, the Hindu uh, uh, culture's uh, chant for, uh, for the word Om has been uh, uh, resonating uh, with the, the Schumann resonance and it is uh, uh, apparently at 7.3 hertz. Again, I start Karoya. Please yeah. cut, cut yeah. off. fast over there. Okay. Okay, so uh, what are solfeggio, uh, solfeggio frequencies? Uh, we have, uh, uh, these are some frequencies uh, that have been used since uh, ancient times for healing purposes and uh, they have been study, uh, they have been scientific studies for the same uh, in the recent years for sound healing, uh, sound therapies and healing therapies. Uh, they're also known as Schumann's uh, resonance frequencies. And uh, uh, the, a particular frequency, 7.83 hertz, is apparently uh, known for its uh, therapeutic benefits and uh, it's referred, it's correlated to uh, the uh, a chant in Hindu uh, uh, culture as Om. So, and uh, we, we've, and this uh, 7.83 hertz uh, is, uh, comes under the alpha waves frequency and uh, we have uh, implemented this frequency in our binaural tone generator. Okay, now we have divided this frequency into a nine types. For example, um, for example, if you want to remove the pain uh, uh, or you are undergoing this pain for a long time, if you want to remove it, you can you, you have to use it 174 hertz. And if you want to liberate some kind of uh, mental uh, fear and guilt kind of things, you have to use 396. So, uh, and if you want to connect to the cosmos, you want to use a 963 hertz. So these frequencies are actually going to transform your brain waves and you're going to uh, feel liberated into each level. Now, uh, how are binaural tones uh, generated and accepted in our brain? So, uh, our brain, uh, you have uh, we provide two different frequencies uh, via the left and the right ear. For example, if uh, you provide 200 hertz of frequency tone from your left ear and 205 uh, frequency tone from your right ear, your brain will automatically uh, uh, calculate the mathematical difference of these two frequencies. That is, in this case, 5 hertz. Uh, and that is the theta zone for uh, stage 2 of sleep. So uh, this is how the brain automatically detects uh, two uh, binaural tones and hence we are able to uh, uh, benefit from these. Okay, now for generating this kind of a binaural sound waves, we have used a Python. So we have used a two channel left uh, frequency, we are giving it one frequency as Simrath was already mentioning, is going to be a mathematical subtraction inside your brain. So we give a two frequency on left frequency to left ear and the right frequency to right ear. And this uh, difference has been will be formed inside our brain and the frequency is we will be given to or given inside the brain and we could able to see the changes in the uh, waves. 
Okay, now we, uh, we, we are actually showing here our, uh, how a multi-tone frequency is being generated. So we have generated a multi-tone frequency and uh, the bottom most, uh, we, it is being shown that we have a different frequency at different frequency levels we have been showing and we have a different amplitude. And this amplitude and this frequency are corresponding to the brain wave and which brain wave to trigger and which, which segment to influence. Okay, so our next uh, in progress is that uh, we'll collect your data from a real-time EEG uh, sensor, that is a NeuroSky headset, and uh, we'll use that for analysis. And uh, next in line is that we'll uh, finish up our neural network training and learning framework, and then we'll uh, build uh, build around different uh, neural networks, and uh, we'll classify uh, the types of brain waves, and uh, we'll we'll give it uh, for uh, for feedback and retraining, and then we'll finally uh, combine it with our uh, tone generator. That is already done, and then we'll uh, have a final uh, test run. Okay, so uh, the, some of the features of our uh, of our uh, end product for Sleep Tune will be that we'll be able to identify different brain waves, and we'll be able to monitor uh, the. Uh, these brainwave activities, alpha delta activities in a person, and we'll be able to generate binaural tones according to a person's uh, brainwaves. And this, uh, hence, can be applied uh, for, uh, for sleep-deprived patients and uh, for people who, uh, who want uh, to relax and go for some rejuvenation therapy. These are some of the references that uh, we've collected our data from. Uh, that will be all. So throughout this video session, I think you would have uh, heard a tones which is overlaying on our, on our voice. These are the binaural tones which we generated. This is used to generate yourself. So I hope you would have enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Boyang Chen and uh, me, Robina Gabriela, will be presenting a project on uh, computer vision based on vehicle recognition. Uh, so the purpose, the main purpose of this project is to be able to recognize logos in real time. So we will be using uh, the Jetson Nano and a camera uh, associated uh, connected to the Jetson Nano. So the camera will uh, pick up images of uh, car logos and we will uh, send it to the neural test, uh, test on a neural network, a trained neural network. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the neural network will be used to uh, predict the logo accurately. So the technology we are using is recognizing two car brands with a 95% accuracy. Uh, the main objective is to uh, train the convolution neural network that, so that it can predict the brands in an efficient uh, way. Uh, so uh, the brands that we are going to be predicting would probably be Toyota, Honda, Hyundai, Volkswagen, and so on. So the data set, the 80% of the data set that we have, we are going to use it for to train the network. And the remaining 20% of the data set will be used to test the model. And uh, we have picked convolution neural networks because it matches the features with the uh, universal uh, and uh, makes approximations based on universal approximation theorem. And that's how we are able to uh, utilize a convolution neural network to make predictions and uh, get accurate results in real time. Uh, so as you can see the, on the screen, this is our system diagram. So we have an input image like uh, the, uh, the car as shown in the image, out of which we will be extracting only the area about the logo. Uh, so for a convolution neural network to understand an image, it should be sent into a format which can, uh, uh, which the system can understand. So we use a, ma a matrix uh, a, a based uh, image format, which will be sent into the convolution layer uh, to, uh, to, uh, to train the model and then uh, to the pooling layer. And then uh, it will be flattened uh, from uh, a two dimension to a one dimension so that the dense layer can be trained properly. And finally, the fully connected layer will give us the predicted results, will classify and give us the predicted results. The software tools we are using is um, um, Keras um, APIs and uh, TensorFlow and Python. And we are um, running Python on uh, the Jupyter Notebook from Anaconda. Um, so, um, this is our data set, and um, the data set is from um, Kago, and it includes uh, 8,000 uh, training images um, shared by 10, 10 brands of 10, 10 vehicle brands. 
and also there are um, 2,000 images for the testing neural networks, and they are also um, equally separated by the temperance. Uh, yes, so the hardware tools we are using uh, will be mainly about a Jetson Nano developer kit and um, we'll connect it to a camera and it will display it through the monitor. Yes, so this is our current results. So we will start the, our process by reading in the images. And uh, we can see that uh, we can put uh, our vehicle brands in this category. So it will read in the, each brand of images. Um, secondly, we will resize the image to 50 by 50. So the data won't be extremely large and it, it can cause um, crash or, or difficulties for computation. Yes, um, this is the current resource for running two categories of the data set. And uh, we can see we have a high accuracy um, to training it. Um, however, due to some um, computational um, issues, um, the accuracy will start, will, will drop uh, dramatically with uh, more categories, such as uh, four categories in this case. So uh, as we initially said, one of the technical difficulties we had was to uh, set up the model accuracy. We had a model accuracy of 96% for two categories, but as we increased it higher and higher, our uh, accuracy kept decreasing. We're still working on uh, fixing this issue. Uh, and uh, well, another uh, main issue with uh, using Jupyter Notebook was the usage of memory on the system. So the more memory it uses, uh, the, there's a higher possibility that the uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook would crash. And uh, we would not be able to view the tensor board graph because uh, the local host crashed. So these are the technical issues we had. Next slide. Uh, so, um, so apart from that, the uh, applications where our system could be used would be for automatic surveillance, intelligent transport systems, it could also assist police departments to track suspected vehicles or, tra or track lost and uh, lost vehicles. Uh, probably identify cars that are uh, in involved in hit and run cases or identify cars at highway tolls and so on. Uh, or it can also be used for security checks where we can identify vehicles at country borders. Or any car enthusiast can use the system to identify a car manufacturer. Uh, we could also extend uh, the systems, application, uh, systems applications to analyzing car speeds to determine the maximum speed a particular model can handle. Uh, so th thank you. That This is a, a project. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, uh, shoot it out. Well, let's begin. Hello, professors and students. Welcome to IIT Armour College of Engineering, ECE Department, ECASP, Summer Design Project Sharing. My name is Mo Fan Qing. You can call me Morris if you like. Here is my individual design project poster sharing. My topic is ROS Mini Car based on just a Nano B01 and STM32F103. And my advisor is Dr. Sani. My presentation can be divided into 11 parts. To begin with, I will talk about the abstract part. In this part, I am focused on two questions. Why I choose Jetson Nano B01 and why I use ROS, Robotics Operating System. The answer is correct, is extremely strict. This is because Jetson Nano B01 and ROS, which are directly focused on AI and machine vision for unmanned vehicles. So to practice myself more on AI and machine vision, I want to use the Jetson Nano B01 with a more practical and realistic project, and ROS Mini Car is just suitable for this. Then I will talk about hardware and software I have used in my individual design project. 
I have used two, I have used eight kinds of hardware. They are just a Nano B01 single board, STM32 F103 single board, ROS Deeps camera, RIP Radar A1 radar, four metal magna wheels, four motors for wheels, metal parts for achieving this ROS mini car, 12 voltage charging battery. For software, I have used Python for OpenCV on just a Nano B01. Linux and a Ubuntu system for ROS on laptop. Then I will talk about constructing this ROS mini car. As you can see here, there are three view photos for this ROS mini car. Top view, front view, and side view. My ROS mini car can be divided into two levels, the upper level and the under level. The upper level has STM32F103, Rep Radar A1 radar, and ROS Deeps camera. The under level has just a nano B01, four metal wheels, four motors for wheels, several metal parts, and 12 voltage charging battery. What is more, Rip Radar A1 radar is used for drawing G mapping algorithm laser map and navigating. And ROS Deeps camera is used for object detecting and tracking. Then, I will talk about this G-mapping algorithm and show how I use this G-mapping algorithm to draw this map. To begin with, G-mapping algorithm belongs to SLAP algorithm, which has complicated internal implementation for developers. And the G-mapping algorithm package also contains robotic deep information, IM information, and automated information. So, in my individual design project, because Ubuntu system for ROS has already integrated the G-mapping algorithm during installing. So in this situation, what I should do is directly use this G-mapping algorithm. Here is a node distribution tree for this G-mapping algorithm. I directly use Linux command to grab it out from ROS in Jetson Nano B01. As you can see in this figure, G-mapping algorithm receives later radar scan data and proceeds to draw this laser map out. After that, we can get laser map on RVIZ application in Ubuntu system for this ROS system. Then, I will show everybody the process of for drawing this G-mapping algorithm laser map. Here are two screenshots for this process. As you can see in these two screenshots, there are white area, green area, black lines, and red lines. What meaning of them? Okay, white area is what we know to be safe. Green area is unknown area which radar does not pick up. Black lines are what we identify as scan obstacles. Red lines are obstacles which radar scans in real time. So that's different, okay? Then I will talk about the result for this G-mapping algorithm laser map. As you can see here, there are two photos. The left one is finished laser map for my house. The red one is the right one is my house structure chart. These two photos are similar, which means my ROS mini car scans correctly and works functionally. Finally, I will talk about future work. So in this part, I mean in the next week, I will be focused on navigating through this laser map. Then my ROS mini car will move to the final step. That will be the object tracking and detecting by using ROS Deep's camera. After that, the whole individual design work can be finished. Thanks my advisor, Dr. Sani and TAU's help, and I do really learn a lot from them. Again, thanks for everybody is watching my poster sharing. That's all. Thank you everyone. Hello, my name is Jolie Perner, and this is my research on how I adopted BIM to achieve lead building design and construction credit. In the architecture, engineering, and construction industry, the need for increased efficiency and sustainability has become more evident. Buildings in the U.S. account for nearly half of all greenhouse gas emissions. Building information modeling, BIM, is a platform where professionals in the AEC industry can collaborate and optimize construction projects to increase overall project efficiency. 
BIM tools such as Autodesk Revit and Insight 360 can be used to analyze and optimize building performance. Using the USGBC's guide to lead certification, this research will study the ways in which BIM tools may be utilized to earn lead points. Furthermore, it will investigate strategies to reduce building, buildings energy use intensity and annual costs. Developing my research required me to use several BIM strategies within Revit and Insight 360. To start, I performed a systems analysis on the model to determine the baseline energy consumption. Before the Insight plugin runs any analysis, the location of the model must be established in order for the correct weather data to be loaded. I chose Chicago, Illinois. Next, I performed two lighting analyses to measure compliance with the first two options of the lead daylight credit. These analyses included the spatial daylight autonomy analysis and the lead V4 option two analysis. The tool that runs both of these analyses generates lead points automatically. Following was the solar PV energy analysis. For this analysis, I measured the potential solar energy produced for varying panel efficiencies. Finally, I used Insight 360 to optimize energy performance factors of the building in an effort to comply with the lead energy performance optimization and lead interior lighting credits. Insight allows users to create scenarios to compare different optimization strategies. Then the scenarios that I created included window to wall ratio and shading, wall and roof construction, lighting efficiency and daylighting controls, plug loads, HVAC and PV systems. My results were the following. The systems analysis results were used to determine what the energy requirements of the baseline building model were. These were used to compare with the future optimization results. After four iterations of the lighting analysis, neither option was able to earn any points towards the light lead daylight credit. The solar analysis, however, provided highly satisfactory results. Each iteration of the analysis were measured to achieve five points for the lead renewable energy credit. The points were determined by comparing the amount of electricity generated by the solar panels to the amount of energy needed for the project. Insight 360 showed that through various optimization scenarios, the building could earn a total of 16 points towards the lead optimized energy performance credit. The points were determined by considering the percent improvement of the building's EUI and the annual cost. It was also able to earn one point towards the lead interior lighting credit for establishing daylighting and occupancy controls within Insight. Using Revit and Insight 360 as tools to investigate strategies to optimize building performance and earn lead points proved successful. My building optimization strategies improved the EUI by 61% and the annual cost by 69%. Additionally, the final model surpassed the Architecture 2030 benchmark for annual costs, but not for EUI. The project achieved a total of 22 points under EA Optimized Energy Performance, EA Renewable Energy, and EQ Interior Lighting. Unfortunately, no points were earned for the EQ Daylight Credit. For future research, I will study adjustments to the building orientation, amount of windows, glazing types, and the effects of reflective surfaces. I'm also interested in exploring ways in which shading caused by other structures would affect the overall energy performance of the building. I will perform a more in-depth research of the HVAC systems beyond just the sizing. I would also seek to achieve Architecture 2030 for both EUI and annual costs. Finally, I would be interested in comparing the results from other BIM software such as Sapphira. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.